Rigoberto Sanchez, possible Achilles injury, how that affects the team moving forward. And to help me answer those questions, I brought in George Bremer, Harold Bulletin, also has a really cool podcast. If you haven't had a chance, go out and listen to it, The Blue Horseshoe. Hey, George, how you been? Good. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Um, never never loved to, to hear these injuries. Uh, you know, we had Drew Ogletree back a little bit ago, and now it seems like Sanchez. We don't know 100%, so it's not been a, you know announced by the team, but it doesn't seem good, George. I mean, it just doesn't seem good. No, I mean, anytime you hear Achilles, you're already going to be, you know, feeling pretty negative about what, what's coming next. Uh, and the fact that it happened during wind sprints out there at the end of practice, uh, it's just not a good sign. You know, no, no non-contact injury turns out well more often than not, uh, far more often than not. I think everyone kind of knows where this is headed or at least fears, you know, greatly fears where this is headed. Uh, it's a big loss for this team. I mean, there's no question Sanchez has been one of the better punters in this league for the five years that he's been here. I think directionally he's as good as it gets. Uh, they're going to have to go and, and, and fit in a new punter in all likelihood, at least for a while. I mean, even if it's not the whole year, which is the fear in, in the likelihood, uh, you're still going to have to do it for a good chunk of time. I, I think no matter how this, this turns out, um, you know, puts more stress on the, on the coverage teams. But I guess one more reason not to punt this year, make sure that that, that guy doesn't have to be used. Exactly, man. And I've had a lot of people, George, asking me over the last, you know, 24 hours, not, not even quite 24 hours, you know, who would you go, get to replace them? And I'm thinking, eh, I, I, you know, it, it's a complete nothing. I don't know at this time of the year. I'd love to sit here and come up with this list and say, hey, will you just go out here and you'd like to talk to this guy or you'd like to talk to this guy? Well, there's really not a list, is there, George? I mean, I mean, you're scouring, you're digging, you're almost desperate throwing darts and, and just hoping you can get someone that can kind of help you get through the season. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's always a short list with, with Chris Ballard, and I'm sure that they're on the phone as we speak, if not, you know, finalizing a deal. Uh, but and the guy who comes to mind, I guess, most immediately is Matt Hack, uh, just because the Bills just released him, so mm -hmm. – uh, obviously, he was there last year in Buffalo and, and was part of a team that made a playoff run. So you feel like that's somebody you can probably live with. He's left footed, which is interesting. You know, that that's a pretty rare thing out there. Uh, there are some teams that prefer that. New England always tries to have a, a left footed punter. I'm not sure how that if it if it does at all factor in. I'm not I'm not sure how that factors in. You know, other than that, um, just guys are on the street. And you could yeah. wait. I mean, we know Chris Ballard's patient. You could wait if you think there's another situation like Buffalo where someone's going to get cut and you like, you know, either a young punter out there or another veteran. I think Hack makes a lot of sense because he's been in the league for five years, uh, had been with the Dolphins before prior to Buffalo. It, right now he'd be my, like, leading candidate. But, yeah, it's it's not like you can go through the draft again. Uh, and find somebody. It's not like there's a, a ton of punters on, on the free agent market. Um, you just got to go and, and find something that works for you. And, and the odds that they're going to find somebody who can give them everything Sanchez gave them are not very good. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree. You're just trying to kind of manage that situation as it goes. So it's going to be a, it's going to be one of those situations that I, you know I'm sure like you mentioned that Chris Bowers is scouring and kind of going through, probably uh, leaning on a little bit of Bubba Ventrone's ear to say, hey, who you like out there? You know, is there anybody that we should be you know bringing in for a tryout? And hell, we might have to even go through a couple this year. You know, I mean that just might be what it, what happens when it comes down to it. Um, but more than anything, man, we just hope he gets a speedy recovery. We hope it's not bad news. Um, he's a pretty good guy. So it, it, very easy to root for. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I think he'll bounce back on the other side. So, George, had this question for you. Final week of, you know, training camp. Is there anything – I mean, there's just not a lot left to look at. We've pretty much seen everything. But is there anything that you're saying – there's a little bit of unfinished in unfinished business, and I'd like to see a little more of this before I kind of, you know, make the determination of who I think is going to round this roster out. Yeah, you know, I think there's a couple things on on each side of the ball. Offensively, we've been talking about, we've been harping on it 
really since March, you know, the, the, the receiver depth and who's going to step up there and, and make plays. And I think you'd still like to see some somebody come out and, and be consistent behind Michael Pittman Jr. Guys have made flash plays throughout camp. You, you had, you know, Des Patman just had the huge game Saturday against Detroit. Mike Strawn uh, looked really good in that game coming off of just a couple days of practice, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, but you'd like to see somebody go out there in these last two practices and, and really put up two really strong days. Uh, and certainly against Tampa Bay on, on Saturday when the starters are going to play uh, for the whole first half, you'd like to see, you know, whether it's Paris Campbell, whether it's Alec Pierce, whether it's Ashton Doolin, somebody behind number 11 come in and, and have a really good game and just kind of help to, to solidify that situation. Defensively, I think it's the run game. Uh, I don't think it's panic time by any stretch of imagination, but DeForest Buckner said it yesterday. 174 yards is unacceptable, even in a preseason game. Uh, I think it's something they know there's going to be a little bit of trade off there. The, the Gus Bradley defense certainly doesn't put as much emphasis on that area as the Matt Eberflus defense did. And most of the time, that's probably going to be a good thing. I mean, this is a passing league. You want to be better against the pass. The Lions were really inefficient throwing the ball in that game. Uh, I think, you know, when you get Grover Seward and DeForest Buckner and eventually Shaquille Leonard out there, that run defense is going to look a lot different. But that's another thing on Saturday with the starters playing. Shaq's not going to play, obviously. But the other starters playing for a half uh, against the Bucks, you know, just like to see that run defense uh, shore things up a little bit, provide a little more confidence there. I think most of the position battles are over. Uh, they really probably have been for a while. I think everybody expects Rodrigo Blankenship to win that kicking job. Uh, Matt Pryor's already been announced as the left tackle winner. And especially with the concussion situation with Isaiah Rogers, Brandon Faison's going to win that third corner spot. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of drama left. Uh, really just looking for a new punter and, and trying to make sure that some of the, the areas that have been problem areas, uh, continue that you continue to work on them. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Shaq Leonard a second ago, George. Um, wouldn't be a podcast here on the No Horsing Around show if we didn't have something to talk about when it comes to this guy. And he's just so vital. I mentioned yesterday in the pod that we did, he's the lifeblood of this defense. He's the energy. Um, and you're just different. So it's been some talk about this PUP, and it's a little bit confusing for me, and I'm a pretty, you know, I'm a nerd when it comes to it. So I'm sure fan base as well has a little bit of a hard time wrapping their head around how this PUP is going to work and how it, it is working. I know there was a 4 o'clock deadline. No real official announcement as far as how that's going to be handled. Is that something that they don't have to announce to us? They just kind of do it internally and life goes on? Or, or will we find out at some point how they're going to handle that moving forward? Uh, we'll find out on cut down day. I mean, when they do that, it'll be one of the moves that, that's announced, if not before. Uh, but by that 4 p.m. next Tuesday, when they have to get down to 53, they have to do all of that there. They'll either have to leave him on putt, up or they'll have to activate him. If they activate him, that'll be part of uh, the transactions that go down that day. The way that Frank Reich was talking yesterday, I'd be surprised if he's still on pup. I mean, it sounds like Reich really wants to get him out there. Even if he's not ready to go, even if it's going to be a couple weeks until he's on the field to play, he wants to get him out there and practice, get him some reps, even if it's just limited work because he hasn't done anything all spring. Uh, you know, I think you just want to get his feet wet a little bit. And we know this is a guy who gets up to speed very quickly. I don't think there's a lot of concern in that that regard but if he's on pup he can't do anything it's not just four weeks until you play you can't participate at all in practice and so i think that that's if that happens if he's still on pup when the regular season starts to me that'll be a bit of a red flag because that's them saying he's not even in a spot for four weeks that we think he can practice uh that would be very concerning i don't he's been out there i mean you were out there a couple times he's been out there every day he's in good spirits He's not the type of guy to be in good spirits if things aren't going well for him. I know he's frustrated about not being on the field, but I expect that, that he'll come off pup uh, by that 53-man cut down day, if not before. Now, when he's on the field, that's a whole other question. My understanding is this is a nerve thing, trying to get the strength back into that calf where it needs to be and into that ankle. Uh, and, you know, we've been down that road before with yeah. Peyton Manning. You understand it, it happens when it happens. There's no 
exercise he can do to speed it up. There's nothing else that can be done. You just got to wait. And when it passes whatever test that, that they're giving it uh, and the strength level is where it needs to be, he'll be back. I think the one thing about it is they're trying to be very, you know, even though I was saying they want to get him out there and be limited as soon as they can because obviously that's what you want to do. They're trying to make sure he's 100%. They don't want to bring him back at 99 even right now. Once he gets back, he's back, he's full go, and you can just build from there. I think that's the goal, and, and that's what everybody's working towards. Yeah, I mean, you said it very well there. I think also, you know, it, it might be one of these situations where they're doing – they're doing Shaq Leonard one of these things where they're protecting him from his own self, you know, where they know the type of guy that he is. And, you know, as we get into next week, all the cameras go away. The media availability gets much more limited. Might be nice to let him practice in that type of environment where we're not seeing what's going on. It takes this pressure of, hey, this deadline that you got to be back. One date that I did have circled in my mind just as a fan Seems like it'd be hard to keep him out of that Kansas City home opener, you know, him running out of the tunnel for, you know, coming back after this just really frustrating injury for himself. Be very interesting, something that we'll monitor and we'll probably know sooner rather than later how this is going to go, no doubt about it. Wanted to double back on some wide receiver talk. Paris Campbell to me, George. It's been a week, a little bit of a weird training camp for me and some things have happened. I know I text you during the game and you're a level headed person. I'm sometimes a little bit up and down. So I, I need you to kind of talk me off the ledge. Seems like he had a great first week of training camp. He made some plays. He flashed since then. It's been a little bit vanilla for him. And one thing that stood out to me was in that Lions game, they wanted to get him some extra reps, but Ashton Doolin didn't even play in that game, but Paris Campbell did. Now that is a, far shift from what, where the Colts' mind was probably going into the offseason if both of those players were healthy, that's a that's a little bit of an odd situation, and I'm going to be monitoring that, especially on cut down day. I'm not saying he's going to be cut. I mean, I think there's definitely a talent there, but something's going on where they're needing to see a little bit more from Paris Campbell, George. Yeah, I was a little surprised that he was out there uh, just because I thought – you know, he's one of the veterans, and, and most of those guys weren't going. I think a lot of it is they just want to get him some more reps. He, he didn't have many, you know, the last couple of years, as we're well aware, uh, in the regular season. So I think you're just trying to get him as, as much of a run as you can. And, you know, I don't know where the hamstring is. I think that's that's where everything turned. He All spring long and the start of training camp, he looked incredible. He was actually ahead of Pittman with, in, in terms of, chemistry with Matt Ryan early on uh, that started to pass the longer that the Pittman, you know, was on the field in, in training camp. But ever since that hamstring injury where he missed a day or was on the sideline for a day, he hasn't been the same. And I'm not sure which right now there, there's kind of a two schools of thought and I'm not sure which way it's leaning. I'm not sure if that's still bothering him and that's what we're seeing or I'm also not sure if they've told him to dial it down a little bit and said, hey, you know what, go 70% the rest of the training camp or whatever it may be. Uh, I'm also not sure as far as preseason games go how much focus he's getting in terms of they they want him on the field. They want him testing that hamstring. They want him to feel good about where he is physically going into week one. But they also don't want to show much offensively. And so I think he's one of those guys, if, if you're looking at, you know, obviously one of the benefits they have is no one's seen Matt Ryan in this offense in, in a live setting, and you're going to be as vanilla with him as you can possibly be. Uh, so nobody has much video on that. But I think that Paris Campbell kind of fits into that too because he's one of those pieces that uh, opponents don't have a lot of film on him. He hasn't played a ton of games. So, you know, I think as little as you can do with him uh, that people can see right now, the better – but you do, I, I, to me, it's all about that hamstring. Where's that at? Is that still a nagging injury? Is it slowing him down? Or is it a situation where they're just saying, hey, you had a tweak there. Let's just take it easy. Let's get you to week one in, in the best shape possible. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those crazy – Man, the guy just seems to have something come up all the time when it comes to the injury, and that's just so unfortunate because he's a great – he's another great kid. I mean, he really is, and he, and he has such a positive way of looking at life in general. I mean, he just keeps going. He keeps fighting for that spot. So, hopefully he has a great year. He, owns, he gets his second contract, be able to take care of his family. 
So we got Michael Strong, we got Desmond Patman, maybe fight fighting for that final spot. I feel like um, this is just a flashback to last off season a little bit as well, George. I say they can both possibly make it. Maybe we keep six wide receivers, three tight ends. I don't know. I'm not there yet. I'm going to kind of look that, at that after this last preseason game. If you had to go with one, um, I'll start and I'll let you kind of finish. I probably pick Strawn just a little bit just because of the, the sheer size, speed, ability, what he can be and what he could be. Um, Patman is good, um, no doubt about it, but I think we know more about what he is already, and that's probably what you're going to see day to day with him in the NFL. I think Michael Strawn could be – this is just the tip of the iceberg for that kid. He's got something. There's an it quality in him. Where are you at with those two? Yeah, I agree. I think Strong's got the higher ceiling. Uh, you know, I think he, if I had to pick one, I would probably go with Strong just because you, you don't really know, you know, where that ceiling is with him and you want to continue to explore that. I do think the Drew Ogletree injury really opens the door to, to keep six receivers. Um, before that, I'm not sure that I would have been as, as much on that, that train. Uh, but now there's really not a fourth tight end on this team that I think is, you know, critical that, that I would want to keep more than Strawn or Patman. Now, the other thing about that is, you know, every year on cut down day, Tuesday will come, there'll be a 53 man roster. People will celebrate, Hey, I made the team. And then Wednesday they'll sign somebody else off of somebody else's roster. And, you know, all of a sudden it, things change. There's at least one of those every year. There could be two or three this year. Tight ends, one of those spots that I'm looking at. I wouldn't totally rule out wide receiver in that regard. I think it's let lower on that, that totem pole, but if there's somebody they really liked, I wouldn't totally rule it out. I think the interior offensive line and defensive line are, are both places that, that could be looked at too, and maybe cornerback. But I think if I had to pick one between Strawn and Patman, I would go with Strawn. Uh, just because you look at that size and speed, the athleticism that he has, and you still haven't seen a ton from him. The The injury uh, this spring really was unfortunate just because uh, you didn't get a chance to see how much he might have grown in year two, and what you have seen now that he's out there is tantalizing. It makes you wonder if this guy had been here since April, you know, would it be a different conversation? I don't know, uh, but I, I think if I had to choose between them, I'd want to see more of him. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And – I think a lot of people have a, haven't even wrapped their minds around this. He came back to play football last week. <laughs> like, like he came back and was doing that. I mean, no, like, hey, no training wheels, no caution. Just go out and play football and do what you do. And man, when he runs those routes, he just gets open. It's a weird. It's like it's just he for his size. I mean, he just seems so fluid in and out of his breaks. It's pretty interesting. Every single year, George, in training camp preseason, we have a training camp or preseason superstar, and this year's no different, right? Sam Ellinger is the training camp, the preseason superstar. We all know about the preseason quarterback rating. He's looked good. you got to give credit where credit's due, George. He has improved. There's no doubt about it. But we just – you don't know what you don't know, and he's never gotten a chance to do that at the highest level. So it, right now it's projecting how he would be. No way in the world in my mind that Nick Foles is not the backup for this team. They, it was a two-year deal. They tied him at the hip. They wanted that veteran presence in case something went south with an older quarterback in the, in the locker room. Is it too early to say that – we may keep three quarterbacks this year. Are we going to roll the dice, get him on that practice squad, and say he's our protected practice squad guy as the year goes along? Where are you at with the Sam Ellinger fandom right now? Yeah, I mean, first of all, he's a really easy guy to root for. I mean, you talk about yeah. the, the good guys on this team. He's right there at the top of the list, and, and he's been through a lot more than than worrying about a roster spot on a football team and, and shown his character and, and, you know, how strong he is. So, um I don't think anything that happens to Sam Ellinger is going to be bad. You know, anything he does in life, he's going to succeed at it. Uh, I think he's just a terrific kid, and everyone who's around him feels that. He's a natural leader. He has every intangible that, that you can imagine. Uh, but, you know, he said it himself, there's a lot of work still to do. And trying to get that shoulder where it needs to be, trying to get his mechanics, you know, to, to, to be perfect every time. And, 
you know, he's putting in the work, and that's what I think you want to see. And you're, you're already seeing results of that. He worked with Tom House since March, uh, but he said himself, it's a two-year program. You know, it, it's going to take a while because you are – your muscle memory, you know, you're going to revert to that when things get chaotic out there. When, when things break down and, and you're in the heat of battle, you're going to go back to, to the way you always played, and, and he knows that. So he's got to try to break all those tendencies – He's got to basically teach his muscles new movements. Uh, that's a long process, and he admits it. You know, he's open about it. He also said that if he wants to play in this league for 15 years, he probably needs to spend the first three learning. You know, I think he's as aware of who he is and, and what his limitations are as any player in the league. It's remarkable to me how mature he is in that regard. And – you know, he, he knows it. He gets it. Um, I wouldn't rule out three quarterbacks on a 53-man roster, but I don't think it's going to be a priority. Not as much as, as maybe a lot of people watching games right now would like to think. For one thing, you're looking at a guy, for everything I just said about him, and there's so many positives, and he has improved leaps and bounds from a year ago. You know, he deserves all the credit he's getting. He deserves all the success that he's getting. But you're looking at a guy who's not going to impact this football team in the regular season for two years, and has said so pretty much himself. And he's he's going to be the third quarterback. This is Matt Ryan's team. Nick Foles is the guy who's one snap away from going in. That's not changing. You can't, at the 53-man roster, you can't prioritize a guy who's not going to affect the team for two years. And I understand, you know, where people are going, but I feel like we had the same conversation about Stephen Morris. We had the same conversation the last year P.J. Walker was here. We had the same conversation about Chad Kelly. Sooner or later, you see a pattern there. That's nothing against Sam Ellinger. I think, again, I think he's a great kid. I think he's going to succeed, you know, in a lot of areas of life. And he may eventually get to a point where he can be a quality backup quarterback in the NFL. I don't even, you know, doubt that. Uh, But he's not there yet. And I think the Colts know that, and he knows that. And there's still work to be done. So, you know, will they keep him on a 53? If they do, I think it's going to be more a reward for what he's done. It'll be trying to send a message to this locker room that if you work like that guy and you put the, the time in and you get the results on the field, you'll be rewarded. If it happens, I think it'll be more from that standpoint. Yeah, it'd be very interesting. So as we kind of round out the season, we're going to go into that waiver wire as we cut, you know, I think Mike Chappell put it the best. I've, I've listened to him over several years. He said, that's the most grueling 24 hours in all of the NFL. You call your mom and dad, grandma, wife, significant other, and say, hey, guess what? I made the team. You call them the very next day and say, oh, by the way, <laughs> I made it for 24 hours and now I'm cut because we went on this waiver wire. We know Chris Bauer loves working that waiver wire. Is there any position group or groups that you think Chris is going to be like, hey, we got to get – we got to get another another body. We got to get a little bit better at that position as we move forward. We all know about the run trouble that we've had, and that's real. You can say and make excuses for what you want, but you're only one or two injuries away from not having a DeForest Buckner and a Grover Stewart there, and you're stuck with what you've seen in the preseason. So I would think defensive line would be something that he would have an eye on. Is there any position groups that you're looking at, George? Yeah, I think the interior of that defensive line really, you know, is high on the list. You can move Tyquan Lewis in there. You can move Dio Adangbo in there. But you'd like to have this year's version of Taylor Stallworth, somebody, uh, you know, who can come in and, and do a good job and you feel confident with him in there. I don't know if they've got that right now. There's a lot of young guys who are still learning. Uh, but I don't – I mean, it might be R.J. McIntosh. He didn't play Saturday against the Lions either. Uh, but we'll see. You know, that that's an area that I think you really need to look at and, and uh, address. I think center is one of those spots. Right now, Danny Penner is the backup center as well as the starting right guard. That's a lot of stress to put on a guy. And, and again, what if he goes down? You know, now what? Uh, so I think that's a spot where you might look and, and see if there's anybody break out. And then cornerback. You know, I after Isaiah Rogers, it's it's a pretty steep decline in, in – you know, can you go and, and get that fifth or sixth corner? I think Dallas Flowers done a pretty good job in the preseason. I think he's a guy, he's on that list of undrafted guys who may make this 53-man roster. Him and JoJo Doman at linebacker, I, I think, are probably at the top of that that list right now. 
but you know, can you? Is there a veteran out there that that, that fits in? Um, we'll see. I think that's going to be a really interesting spot. I think Rodgers is going to have the same role he had last year, being that number four cornerback, being the return guy, making plays every time he's on the field. Uh, and I think face on will, will be that three corner, but who's five and do you trust an undrafted rookie in, in that spot or do you need to go and get, you know, somebody who's not with the team right now? Yeah, man. I mean, it's going to be very fascinating and we all as Colts fans are, are going to be kind of keeping an eye towards who's going to make that final 53. We'll have our final 53 prediction out. I believe next Monday, if anybody's interested in checking us out next Monday, um, George, Two more days of practice. We go into our final preseason game, and then we we hit the full go, man. So it should be interesting. Appreciate you so much for hopping on here. Um, what are you working on right now? Anything in particular? I'm sure you're probably following that Sanchez story pretty t- pretty close. That's right now. that's the biggest thing right now. I mean, just trying to figure out what the Colts are going to do there, and uh, I'm sure that's going to be pretty quick because I, I would imagine they want that guy or need that guy in for Saturday. Uh, and you know, get, not just to get a look at him, but somebody's got to punt, obviously, on Saturday. Uh, so I think that's going to be a pretty quick move. I would expect it by the end of the day today, honestly, uh, just because you, you need to get that done. Uh, and then Michael Pittman is a big story around here. Reggie Wayne had some really interesting things to say about him the other day. I'm working on a story on him that should be up uh, sometime tonight. Uh, just talking about his leadership ability and some of the things he does that, that Reggie compared to what Reggie and Marvin Harrison did back in the day. I think anytime Reggie starts throwing around those names, uh, people's eyebrows are going to raise a little bit. For sure. Absolutely. Guys, if you haven't already joined the No Horsing Around family, we invite you in, man. We want you to use your voice. All you got to do is tap that subscribe button, hit that bell for live alerts and updates, and Hit us up, light us up in the comments. Let us know if you agreed or disagreed with either either thing that me or George said today. We'd love to know you, what you got to say. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and until next time, guys, go Colts.